Well, what about that message, particularly to the Haitian Americans? The message is that, uh, as every other immigrant group that came here before us, uh, the message is that if you come here and you work hard and you play by the rules, the world of uh, uh, opportunities awaits you. The 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 the, the, the world of you know. Uh, Extended opportunities uh, extend uh, await you. Political, and, economic uh, success, all type is of there. opportunities, and and I yeah. and I hope that the message that the young generation of Amer Haitian Americans and other immigrants living here uh, can tap can look into. You know, I think on on the flip side, that can be a double-edged sword when you zero in on someone's ethnicity or race or nationality because mm -hmm. Miami-Dade County, South Florida as a whole, it seems like every issue that comes up before your board is split along black, white, Hispanic lines. How do you overcome that in, in what appears to be a new kumbaya year, a new show of <laughs> unity? Is, is that an issue in those I think, I, think, uh, I think a lesson from business school helped me a great deal. When you go to any territory, you need to try to understand the culture of that particular territory. We understand that it's a very diverse community, a very diverse board, and everybody comes with their concerns and issues. And at the end of the day, if you're new on the board, you need to understand the dynamic and why people stand for the things that they stand for. And if you cannot help them, don't push them away. So I think that's my philosophy. I think it works, and my colleagues understand that. I have the ability to be fair, uh, and I have the ability to be strong as well when I need to, because at the end of the day, leading is not easy, but you have to be responsible. Uh, one of the things that you have done, we're going to take a brief break, but you have restructured the committee system, the way that uh, the commission oversees the way tax money is spent and county government runs. So we're going to talk to uh, Chairman Jean Monestim about that when we come back. Stay with us. We are back with a very interesting discussion with Miami-Dade's <laughs> Commission new chairman, Jean Monestim. Welcome again. And we were talking about, before we went to the break, the new, for a low-key guy, you sure shake things up immediately when you get mm -hmm. into a, a new position. And, and what you have done is dismantled really the commission committee system that's been in place for decades, decades and, uh, and instituted some new committees based on tax money which is what we're going to talk about a lot in the next couple of minutes what why and what are those committees and what do you hope to achieve with those well I approach everything from a perspective of my strength and I was a finance major in college and I understand that we have a huge budget and everything has a fiscal uh, cost whether it's a policy, whether it's a pro program that we're funding, there's a cost associated with it. And, and um, sometimes I'm frustrated with the fact that uh, during our budget season, we only address these issues in a very, very serious way at the end of the budget uh, uh, period. And because of that, I think it was proper that uh, the fact that the budget is one of the biggest, or probably the single most important decision we make every year, of that we start addressing these issues through our committees early. Billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Yeah. Our budget is larger than that of 17 states and 78 countries. So it's important that we set the priorities early in terms of knowing ex exactly what is more essential uh, in terms of services that we need funded for our community, what is more essential in terms of the project that we need funded for our county. And I think that's what we're addressing through our committee system. And you know, when you bring that uh, up the budget, at the end of the budget, so I feel compelled to bring up what's going on right now, the value adjustment board backlogs, and it's such a wonky thing for people to wrap their heads yeah. around how a, the property taxes, when there's a backlog in appeals, the budget that the county is operating right now under services, schools, is 40 to 60 million dollars short, a hole that no one saw coming because of these appeals. Yeah. Well, what is your position on reforming that whole system? And actually, there's a bill just filed with the state yeah. that proposes to do that. Ha that. What kind of problem is that? Obviously, it is, especially for the school district. And uh, what do you do with that? What I, what I understand is that the Value Adjustment Board and, and the Property Appraisers Office, especially the Property Appraisers Office, is independent. And when every segment of our population suffers because of lack of uh, uh, implementation of tax collection, we suffer as well. We suffer as well as the county commission. Yeah. And therefore, uh, we'll work with any one of our partners to make sure that whatever must be done, whether it's traveling to the state and see if we can reform that, whether it's having a better relationship uh, with uh, uh, the people that are in that practice or with the property appraisers office, whether it's is uh, having some ideas being discussed at the le level of the value adjustment board. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm an open-minded individual, 
and everything has to be put on the table and if we do so we'll be successful but as a community. But who's, who's honchoing that through because right now the Mayor Jimenez, Carlos Jimenez told the Miami-Dade School Board it was not his responsibility. It seems no, to have become sued. very political. Whose responsibility is it? How, how is this getting done? Uh, what I think I like the most about this conversation is the fact that uh, both the mayor and the superintendent, they are making arrangements to go to the state and work toward uh, 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 resolving this issue. Through the and, bill. Uh, exactly. And, 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 I'm, and, and I appreciate the fact that they, they think that they have a mutual interest in finding a solution on that. So you, you're, just to be on the record, you are in favor of reforming the value adjustment board process? Uh, to the extent that it brings, uh, uh, you know, better ways of uh, collecting revenues, to the extent that it adds values to what we do in Miami-Dade County and for the school board and our municipalities, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me ask you just generally, uh, I mean, you've got an MBA in, in business and, and you uh, have looked at county government. I want your overall assessment of how well you think Miami-Dade County government, which has, what, uh, 26,000 or so employees, and then if you add in Jackson Health System, it, it gets up to uh, like 35,000. This is a huge municipal corporation, and it runs well in some areas, but not so well in others. Where, where, where is it doing well? Where is it not doing well? Well, that, that was my frustration when I first come to the county commission as a business owner. It's that things move very slowly. And that's the nature of government everywhere. That's what I've learned. That's what I, uh, I, I, I get to understand. And what I'm trying to do is to see how we can be a whole lot more efficient, a whole lot more effective, effective in the things we do. To the extent that we can accomplish that, I think we'll be successful as a, com a, a commission. And I think we have a very good board of county commissioner right, uh, commissioners right now that is very, it's very ready. Collegial. Exactly, it's very, very ready to address issues in a very practical way. And uh, um, that's the nature of the beast. We have to deal with it. Uh, and and uh, but could I, could we have been a whole lot more efficient and effective? Yes. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have. Uh, a legislative body that I serve on, that's the county commission, and the mayor is the administrative leg. Uh, I think this is a question that should be posed to him as well. As you begin the budget process, you're operating this year's budget. Still, there are four contracts yet to be negotiated, yet to be agreed upon. The big ones, police, fire, water and sewer, and one more. What am I forgetting? Police, fire, water. No, transportation? Uh, and, and, transport workers? Yeah. So um, I guess the question becomes, there is a question every year, do you raise the millage, do you raise people's property taxes to fill in the budget holes, do you become more efficient? Well, you have been on the record advocating a possible increase in property tax, which isn't a bad thing or a good thing, this isn't a judgment call question, but that sure is a, a, the third rail when it comes to a politician saying raising taxes to his constituents, where do you stand on the possibility that millage might have to go up? Where are, there are some areas in our government where we're not effectively able to provide services at the rate, the tax rate that we offer, especially in AMSA, where people pay unincorporated, unincorporated yeah. 1.92 millage. There is no way you can provide services with 1.92 millage anywhere. So we fell at that. But having said that, and I've been on the record saying that at least in OMSA, we need to provide, to generate more and provide more services or better services to our people. There's no way you can be effective and efficient at a millage 92. That can't happen anywhere. So, but at the end of the day, I understand as well that my board doesn't have an appetite, an appetite for raising taxes. Because the so, constituents. Yeah, be, uh, I don't know. It depends on whom you serve. It <laughs> depends on whom you serve. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, sometimes we need to lead uh, 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 when we th think it most matters. But, uh, but at the end of the day, what I think people need to understand is that this is an alternative that we should not take off the table. Do I want to raise taxes? I was looking at things today. No. But we don't have a set of priorities yet that we need to be funded in our, in our budget. We need to determine what those priorities are before we determine whether right. we need more money or less money. Right, That's so why I come in. But I understand there is no appetite to raising taxes right, right now. So you're going to put the horse first, then the cart. Exactly. All right. Well, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's something different, but we thank you. Commissioner Jean Monastine, pleasure to have you come in. Great and to see you. we will be speaking with you 
as that budget process unfolds. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and happy Valentine weekend to you all and to your viewers. Yeah. Back to you. Thank you, Back John. To you. <laughs> Up next, we take some of this, the news of the week, to the roundtable. Stay with us. The South Florida headlines this week included some presidential posturing and some moves to legislate which public bathroom you can use. And that can only mean it is time for the roundtable. And we are so glad to welcome back Rosemary O'Hara, editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel, who is recovering from a bad cold. We're glad you're here. Give Nancy away the Ingram is the editorial page editor of the Miami Herald and perfectly healthy. We're glad to <laughs> welcome her back. And here for the first time is our friend Renee Pedrosa, veteran reporter on politics and government in South Florida at America TV. 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 Well, welcome. Vet, vet, welcome veteran. Wow. Welcome. Well, you are. You no, are. It's an honor to be here. Really you're is. among friends. It you're really among is. friends. It's great to be here. I Nancy, respect all four of you. Thank you. And, and Nancy Ancrum, uh, you just heard, we all just heard from John <coughs> Honestine. Uh, I have to say, he strikes me as somebody who has a vision and has a very firm idea about where he wants to go and he wants uh, the county commission to go. And that is so welcome to hear. Someone who expresses a vision, someone who expresses a vision that is going to be a benefit, not just to the people he wants to directly help. I would say low income, working class families. But when you help those families, you, in, you help the entire county, the entire community. Right. I think it is the right vision, and I think he's the right person to really put it forward and push it forward. Mm -hmm. You know, he succeeds Rebecca Sosa, who was chair for a long time, and, and a very similar style. You know, you cover the county commission. Renee, what do you, what do you see as the differences coming up in this new, under this new chair? You know, I was talking to the ladies outside, and I think John Monestine brings, brings a very fresh perspective to that chair. Somebody new, not caught up yet with the whole politics. You asked such an important question between the division between the blacks, the Hispanic, and the whites. Blacks can identify with him. The Hispanics can definitely identify with him because of his, his upbringing being poor, coming to this country, his family, immigrant immigrants, status. exactly. And then yeah. obviously the, the, the Anglo side of it also can identify with him because he speaks the language and can really deliver the message uh, loud and clear yeah. in a yeah. very quiet, right way, like, like, like we you said. Are you stealing my material? Yes, I am. You are stealing yes, my I material. Am, because yeah. I really like it. We're all going to use that. Exactly. We, we, we should point out that uh, there has been some contentious moments in the last year at the Miami-Dade yeah. Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Commissioner Dennis Moss at one point said to Commissioner Javier mm -hmm. Soto, who had said, we, we the Cubans, built this community. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be really very much without you. And Dennis Moss took umbrage, as he well might, mm -hmm. and said, hey, who do you think built the railroad and all this other stuff? It was, it was black people, African Americans and Bahamians. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, I think that the the choice of uh, of John Monastine is a healing kind of thing. Absolutely, I mean, yeah, it? he's got a wonderful Absolutely. focus, and uh, you know, credit also Audrey Edmondson, who was also yes. up for the position, right. who, for the sake of unity, for the sake of forward movement, stepped back and threw her support to him. Yeah, very, very be, classy move. They have Maybe. to be united. They, I mean, they have a five, close to a six billion dollar budget. They have to really work together. If they yeah. don't, it just really falls apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would only caution him to um, temper his uh, vision for tax increases mm -hmm. if that's what it is. Yeah. What I didn't hear him say was that that while the millage is hold, held steady, property values are growing. And so people are paying more in property taxes, True. and there's opportunity for those more dollars. Rosemary, mm -hmm. let me ask you to give us your thoughts about the larger topic of income disparity, because we have already seen, not just in Miami-Dade County, in the nation, of that the, and in the 2016 presidential mm -hmm. race, that is going to be one, if if not the major issue. Yes, it's interesting to see that the Republican candidates are talking about in income inequality. That Jeb Bush has titled his PAC "Right to Rise" is an is an indication that he's not going the way of Mitt Romney, who right. talked about the 47 percent will never reach. Yeah. The question is, how does that happen? And does government play a role in setting minimum wages? Does government 
set a role in telling businesses how to, you know, how to operate. I, right. The question is, how do you make it happen? Well, Jeb Bush made that clear. He talked to the Detroit Economic Club this week, last week, and said basically, big government does not help the poor. And so I think he is clearly signaling where he's going with this. Mm -hmm. And I think, it's a, I think it's a traditional and standard conservative line. He was also considering his audience. And he was standing in the middle of Detroit, of all places. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I think he's trying to make an incursion there in some tri typical Democratic territory. Yeah. You uh, know, while we're talking about Jeb Bush, you know, Marco Rubio was here, stump I, I want to say stumping, but he's not officially stumping yet, but he gave a speech at an event, and, and clearly people want to know, are you running? The e very interesting article in the Washington Post. Uh, can we move on to an issue? It's not a huge issue, may not be an issue at all, but... I unless you really have to go. A, 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 <laughs> We're talking about who can use public bathrooms <laughs> and can transgendered people who uh, were born, say, male, but then uh, see themselves uh, identify as females. You know, a state representative, Frank Artillis of mm -hmm. South Miami-Dade, uh, has uh, filed a bill which says if you were born a male, you've got to go to the men's bathroom. Now, uh, you wrote, or the Sun yes. Sentinel wrote, a really good editorial. Explain what you said in the editorial. Well, the next battleground in the war for equality is um, for those people who are transgendered, people who were born into a body they don't believe fits them. And as they transition into the body they believe, the sex they believe they are, and they start to wear the clothing of the sex they believe they are, the last thing they really want to do is call more attention to themselves by going into the, a bathroom that doesn't suit how they're dressed. So the, so they are, so a, a man who's dressing as a woman or a woman as a man want to use the bathroom that corresponds with how they look. Now comes state government saying, not allowed, you've got to go into the bathroom that suits what your plumbing down below but is. But who, who checks <laughs> in yeah, this who field? Right. Yeah, who checks? <laughs> right. If you can be held, um, if you can be thrown in jail for a year by using the wrong bathroom in a, a public facility, do we want the security guards at the stadium going in and which every know, woman has it? done when there's a line yes. outside? That every into, woman yeah, has gone that goes to the into, you know, violating at some point uh, civil True. rights. I mean, now transgender is a huge issue. It just right. it's become so popular. Bruce Jenner is all over the, the, the papers. Uh, Orange is the new black. Uh, the main star is a transgender who's incredibly popular. I mean, it's it's yeah. a it's a hot issue. It's just not a problem, you know. Exactly. If if people are being, the the concern is that well, people are going to go and peep. Well, if that's such a problem, let's see it. And and instead, it's really part of this national movement to right. try to exactly. pass laws. You know, this is another issue down. where Ileana Ross Lettinen, who has a trans yeah. transgender yes. son. Um, has been very vocal She's and been very progressive really come on down this. on the side of, of, of their rights. What's really yeah. disturbing is the criminalization of yeah. gender identity. Right. And, mm -hmm. and that's the crux of yeah. it. That's well, I was